I call this meeting of the Williamsburg James City County School Board to order. Uh, before we get started this evening, I'd like to uh, welcome Ms. Lisa, Mrs. Lisa Owensby to the uh, Owensby. God, what do I do that? To who joins us this evening? Uh, Mrs. Owensby has been a long-standing member of this community and very active in our schools on many levels. Uh, welcome. We look forward to working with you and getting up to speed on our school system processes and uh, benefiting from your contributions and talents. So, uh, welcome this evening. Uh, can I get a motion for certification of closed session? Mr. Chair, I certify that to the best of each member's knowledge, the Williamsburg James City County School Board, while in closed session, discussed only public business matters lawfully exempted from <coughs> open meeting requirements as stated in Virginia law, and that only such public matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed session meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Ms. Serza? Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Thank you. Um, next item on our agenda is a public hearing on the capital improvement plan. Uh, Mrs. Cook, do we have any speakers this evening? Yes. Mr. J. Everson, please. Mr. Everson, do you need our rules? You, you, you've got them all down, right? Okay. Absolutely. <laughs> I think I got the rules down. I figured you did. J. Everson, 103 Branscombe Boulevard in the county. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, board. Welcome. Uh, congratulations. I'm here on the CIP tonight. In particular, the uh, proposed uh, expansion of the high schools, Middle school, phase two, and the elementary school way out there. But I'd like to focus, if I could, on the more imminent one, which is the high school, to the tune of about $17 million. What I gave you there is a copy of the low projections of the uh, future thing from last year, which we learned is the basis of your budgeting. So you will see highlighted uh, for the elementary, the middle, and the high schools the years in which it's projected they were going to peak. <coughs> and at that point, while they don't fall, they really stay level out for a number of years. According to Future Think, we, we, we're probably right now at the maximum for the elementary schools. It'll remain flat for the next decade. It'll be 21 when the middle schools max, and in 2023 when the high schools max, which would be just about the time that the high school proposed expansion will occur. Now, it seems to me that if our enrollment projections are indicating that we may not need the school, or the expansion, I should say, of the schools, uh, number one. Number two, uh, I, we need to have a full um, disclosure on the, um, the issue of capacity. Now, the high schools are on a four by four schedule. Now, by state law, as you all know, uh, teachers have to have a planning period. So that means at any point in time, 25% of the school, uh, school classrooms in our high schools are empty. If you had a seven period day, you would have, well, what would that be? 14% empty. It's about a 10%, about 9% improvement. Uh, about, I'm going to take that back, about 10 to 11% improvement. And uh, the same would hold, uh, if you went to a six period, it'd be about an 8%. Now, if you look here, you will see that between now and 2023, when this high school expansion would be completed, we're looking about an 8% to 9% expansion of enrollment just at the high school level. Now, I know that last year there was some talk about having a study done on block scheduling. Not only should, if we did away with block scheduling, which would save us about one and a half to 2.25 million a year in teacher salaries, we would also not need to spend $17 million in the next six years. I thank you for your time. That was good timing, hasn't it? I did well, didn't I? You always do well, Mr. Everson. <coughs> thank you very much. Are there any other uh, speaker cards? No, no, sir. Okay, great. Thank you. With that, we will uh, close the public hearing and we will get into our uh, regular meeting agenda. Um, 4.01, hold on a second, Pledge of Allegiance. We have with us tonight uh, third graders from Stonehouse, 
Elementary School, Riley Dowdy and uh, Lawson Jackson to lead us in the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. So uh, you can come over to the microphone. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Thank you, Riley. Thank you, Lawson. It's always good to have uh, students at our at our board meeting. Uh, that takes four point zero two. Uh, the role, Miss Serza. Dr. Beers. Here. Miss Cook. Here. Miss Hummel. Here. Miss Ownby. Here. Mrs. Taylor. Here. Mrs. Young. Here. Mr. Kelly. Here. Thank you. 4.03, approval of the agenda. Can I have a motion for approval of the agenda, please? Anybody? Mr. Kelly, I uh, propose approval of the agenda as stated on the agenda. Thank you much. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? It's been moved and seconded for approval of the agenda as presented. Ms. Serza? Ms. Cook. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Thank you. 5.01, announcement superintendent's report. Dr. Heron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Congratulations to Lafayette High School's German teacher, Karen Woodrum. Her presentation, Deutsche's Kino, German Cinema as a Teaching Tool, was awarded Best of Flava, 2016 at the annual Foreign Language Association of Virginia Conference held in October in Williamsburg. Mrs. Woodrum will be presenting her award-winning workshop session at the Southern C Conference on Language Teaching in Orlando, Florida in March in two, two, 2017. A reminder that the HBCU College Fair is this Saturday, November 19th from 10 till 2 at Lafayette High School. Colleges and universities from Virginia, Maryland, and North Carolina will be in attendance, and there will be information sessions on admissions and financial aid. To register, please visit wjccschools.org and click on the HBCU slide. New Visions Pioneers, a volunteer network, adopted three WJCC schools for the regional volunteer project. The members, consisting mostly of retirees from telephone companies, collected and donated just under 200 backpacks filled with school supplies. School staff attended New Vision's regional, regional meeting to personally thank members and pick up backpacks for their schools. Thank you to New Vision Pioneers for your support of WJCC students. These are all of the announcements I have this evening, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Heron. Are there any announcements from board members? Um, I would just like to make a quick announcement about the superintendent search. The Williamsburg James Kennedy County School Board has hired BWP and Associates to conduct a national search for the next superintendent of Williamsburg James City County Public Schools. BWP and Associates representatives Dr. Kevin Kastner and Dr. Wayne Harris attended a recent school board meeting and to discuss the search and the selection process. The search will include a lengthy period for public input, including a survey available to all residents and public community forums. An online survey will be available on the school's division's website, wjccschools.org, from November 28th through January 13th. Two community forums will be held, uh, one November 28th at the James City County Library at, uh, on Croker Road at 7 p.m., and another one November 29th at the Stryker Center in Council Chambers on Boundary Street, also at 7 p.m. Information gathered from the online survey and the stakeholder meetings will help create a profile of the characteristics this community is looking for in our next superintendent. The survey and the stakeholder meetings will allow the firm to learn strengths and needs of the Williamsburg James City County Public Schools, to recruit the best candidates, be able to describe the opportunities provided by the school division to potential candidates, as well as engage the community to build support for the search. Uh, we will be on November 28th and 29th. There are several uh, meetings that our um, search firm will be engaged in. I uh, appreciate the board members and community members who made suggestions for 
those who uh, should meet with them uh, directly. Uh, Mrs. Serza will be contacting those folks in the very near future um, to, to uh, schedule, to, not to schedule the meetings, we already have a schedule worked out. So uh, uh, there's lots of moving parts to this. So please accommodate Mrs. Serza as best you can if she uh, contacts you. Uh, the, the slots are uh, slots are filling up pretty quickly. So um, we are beginning the search and uh, the, uh, ap the applications, the position will be open until the end of January, I believe the 20th, 20th, somewhere there, January 20th. Um, but uh, from now until then on the BWP website. Uh, with that, 6.01, board recognitions. Mr. Chair, tonight we have a number of individuals to recognize, and we begin with an exceptional Jamestown student. Alexa Halko took home three medals in the 2016 Rio de Janeiro Paralympics. Alexa earned silver medals in the T34 Sport Class 400 meter and 800 meter wheelchair races. She also earned a bronze in the 100 meter race. Even more amazingly, Alexa was named the 2016 United States Paralympics Female Athlete of the Year. Alexa trained for these outstanding accomplishments every day for the past two years, and we are so proud to recognize her this evening. Congratulations again, Alexa. The operations department recognizes team members who demonstrate A++ service based on their outstanding attitude, attention to detail, and attendance. Through strong leadership, quality work, and exemplary customer service, these valued team members make significant contributions to the overall success of our organization. Please join me this evening in congratulating the 2015-16 Service Star recipients. First, Rebecca Donnelly from Child Nutrition Services. Rebecca, please come up. Next, uh, Derek Jones, Custodial Department. <clears throat> We have the privilege of central office of working with Derek every day, and he is exceptional in customer service. Thank you, Derek, again. Congratulations. Again, from the custodial department, Latoria Jones. Latoria Jones. From the transportation department, Richard Marsh. From the maintenance department, Randall Martin. <clears throat> From the transportation department again, Elena Shepard. And from Child Nutrition Services, Sophia Shepherd. And this year's Superintendent's Spirit of Service winner is Darlene Romain.
thank you very much for all of your service and everything you do every single day for us. Uh, Mr. Chair, these are all of the recognitions for this evening. We will have more recognitions in December. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heron. Um, thank you, Alexa, for coming tonight. I, uh, it's really an uh, honor and a privilege for us for you, for you to be here, and uh, we wish you so much. We're so proud of you and wish you much luck in the future. So thank you. And for our operations folks, um, you know, they're really the heartbeat of what we do, and uh, um, you know, we couldn't we couldn't do what we do without without our operations team. So uh, it's great to recognize those folks and for all the great work that they do. So uh, thank you very much. That brings us to 6.02 school spotlight, Stonehouse Elementary School. Dr. Heron. Yes, it's my pleasure this evening to introduce Miss Melissa White, pr proud principal of Stonehouse Elementary School, and she's going to introduce the school spotlight. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Heron. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Heron. Literally, my first sentence was, I'm Melissa White, proud principal of Stonehouse <laughs> Elementary School. <laughs> We're very excited to share with you tonight our focus on student-led conferences at Stonehouse. Um, student-led conferences are directly, let, directly tied to our WJCC strategic plan and indicators 1.14 with developing a model for student portfolios, and 1.15 in establishing a division-wide student goal-setting model. Our third grade teachers, Mrs. Gayton and Mrs. Hill, excitedly took on this initiative last year and piloted it in a smaller arena and are expanding upon it this year, so we are excited to share this with you. In student-led conferences, the students are responsible for setting their own goals and they take ownership in their learning. There are multiple ways to do this, but there are five key factors to keep in mind when setting goals with children. First, the goal has to be clear. I will increase my DRA level from a 30 to a 34 in a nine-week period. Second, the goal is challenging but attainable. They have to believe that they can achieve it. Third, the student's committed and they're determined to reaching that goal because they helped create it. Fourth, it takes time and the tasks that are necessary to complete the goal are understood ahead of time. And fifth, the students receive feedback to help track their progress along the way. As you're gonna see and hear in a few moments, student-led conferences are focused on the individual student, their goals, their progress, and their accomplishments. In short, it's all about individualism, our focus this school year. Oh. 
Jay. Lots are right about there. Nice job. Your neighbor looks good. A story that we had, she gave us a topic and we had to write about it. Good evening. I'm Carmen Gayton and this is Lisa Hill. Thank you for having us tonight. Last year was our first year that we held student-led conferences in our classroom. We received positive feedback from parents and students regarding those conferences. Students love being able to share their successes as well as their struggles with their parents. This year, Mrs. Hill and I decided to have a students play a role in our parent-teacher conferences this week in order to help them identify their goal for the school year. This allowed the parent, the teacher, and the student to work together to come up with a goal that would be attainable that the student could work on throughout the year. Our students are ultimately responsible for maintaining their own portfolio. Therefore, we push them to take the lead as much as possible and collect artifacts throughout the year so that way later, at the end of the year, they can meet with their parents to discuss if they reached their goal. Evening. Evening. I am a parent. My daughter is Riley, sitting over there. Um, being part of the student-led conference this year was very exciting for me. Riley, she was fully involved in identifying all of her strengths and her areas of opportunity. And this allowed her to create a goal and create an action plan and give her a sense of ownership. For me, with the busy life that I have and so many other parents have, having the student-led conference kind of forced me to sit down and really be fully engaged with my daughter and everything that she was learning and what her goals were. The conference was no longer just a list of to-dos that the teacher and I would come up with and then I'd go home and regurgitate to my child. It then became a collaborative effort where Riley was able to set her own goals, confidently knowing that her teacher and I would be able to support her. Riley's teacher is very approachable and she's a great communicator. And I wanna thank her for making this just such a great experience. And I hope that moving forward, we can do the student-led conferences. I had my first parent, student, and teacher conference last Friday. I was excited, but I was also a little nervous because I didn't know what to expect and I was worried I did poorly on something. Instead, we talked about how I need to have more confidence in my math abilities and not second guess myself. We reviewed my report card in areas I can improve. Then we created a goal together. My goal is to score 100 on multiplication using extra math. I wanted to do division two, but we decided I should focus on multiplication first. To reach my goal, I'm going to practice using flashcards and do problem, problem at practice problems at home with my parents. I'm, I'm excited to reach my goal. I had my first, 
had my first parent student teacher conference last Friday. I was nervous and scared because my parents parents and teacher were going to talk about me in front of me. It turned out good. He talked about how I need to write more during writing time. I got I set goals for me to for myself to write more sentences during writing time. To reach my goals, my to reach my goals. My teacher is getting me a special writing journal. I am excited to reach my goals. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Danielle McGill. My son Stevie was in Mrs. Gaten's class last year, so he's a fourth grader this year. I had the pleasure of sitting down with him at the end of the school year in the third grade, um, going through all of the data that he had collected throughout the year. And to be completely honest, I can't remember his goals from last year. That was a long time ago and they change so often. But what I can remember is sitting outside in the pod, uh, waiting for him to collect all of his stuff and get the desk ready for me. And um, watching him come out with that confidence and that maturity and say, Mommy, I'm ready for you. And it was just really neat to, to go in and sit down at his desk and, and see all of, his, all, all of his work, everything that he had put together and, what, and his phase training program that he had put together and, um, and just, just see all of the work that he had done throughout the year and just to know that he had done that and just to see that, that pride and... and um, uh, that part for me was was the most important part rather than the goals themselves. It was just seeing that confidence in him. I hadn't, hadn't really seen that in him prior to that, and I've seen it continuously since then. So I think it's a great program. Well, we hope this year will be another successful opportunity for our students to meet with the parents in June. Um, you will receive an invitation from Ms. White um, in the spring so that you can see firsthand how, we, how these student-led conferences are conducted in our classrooms. And so we thank you for your time. Thank you for having us. And have a good night. Thank you. you any, any board member questions, comments? <clears throat> I, yeah, I would <clears throat> I really like to say that I, I think one of the most important things about what you're doing is, uh, uh, is really helping um, students uh, understand the value of uh, owning your own learning, owning because it, 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 it makes them feel like they're really in charge of themselves and, and what they're doing. So I, I applaud that. And I know conferences are also really helpful uh, as, uh, um, as they go about writing as well. So I'm very much. Uh... Mrs. Owenby? Um, I just want to applaud this effort, too. I think this is great foundation to help students identify early on their learning strategies and their strengths and their weaknesses, and that will help them down the road. I'm thinking about my college student now, and, and, and he could certainly benefit from something like that. <laughs> so that's certainly great um, to lay that foundation early on so they know where they're going, what their goals are, and how they're going to achieve that. That's great. Um, I'd just like to say that I, that was wonderful for me. Um, the innovation, um, I heard parents saying words like engaging and collaboration, and that's, I mean, that's what we want to do in public education. And then I have Riley up there with a tablet reading off of reading and, and Lawson. And, and so the two of you have, have said the Pledge of Allegiance on TV and gotten up here and spoke at the podium. I don't know what you're going to be nervous about at any time going in the future, but uh, you, did a, you did a wonderful job, and I thank you for that. So thank you much. Appreciate it. Takes us to uh, 7.01 public comment. Uh, Dr. Beers? Okay, here we go. Right here. <laughs> it is at this point in our meeting where citizens are invited to address the school board. Those citizens desiring to speak have submitted speaker cards for the clerk bar to the start of tonight's meeting. When a speaker's name is called, the speaker comes to the podium states his or her name for the record, and directs his or her comments to the chair of the board. In order to promote a listening and respectful environment, please avoid uh, applauding, verbal outbursts, or any other type of demonstration when the speaker is addressing the school board. Personal matters are not considered in public meetings, 
And so the school board requests that all speakers refrain from making any reference to specific individuals in any form or fashion. The school board's role is to listen to the speaker rather than respond to his or her comments, and each speaker is allocated three minutes to make his or her comments. The school board asks each speaker to respect this time limitation. Time may not be yielded to another speaker. Your acceptance and adherence to these guidelines will be greatly appreciated. Thank you, Dr. Beers. Mm -hmm. uh, we have six cards this evening. Mrs. Cook? Ebony Flake, please. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ebony Flake, and I live in the Berkeley District. I am here as a member of Williamsburg James City County community and as a representative for the village. Uh, thank you for this opportunity, and thank you, Dr. Heron, for your lovely, soothing voice. <laughs> um, I would like to address the issue of diversity within the Williamsburg James City County school system as far as teachers and administrators. Uh, as we all know, school-aged children and teens are very impressionable as they are building their identities, seeking role models, and establishing their sense of self in the world. Uh, and because of this, it is so important that they have access to teachers, staff, and administrators that understand them and physically reflect their identities. Not only is this important for minority students, but a recent research study funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation in conjunction with NYU has shown that all students, regardless of race, benefit from having diverse teachers in the classroom. The study showed that across the board, middle school, middle school students ages 11 through 13 ranked black and Latino teachers highest in order of preference in a number of areas, including the ability to challenge, motivate, and care for them. There could be a number of reasons for this, but we know that ages 11 through 13 is a particularly socially awkward and uncomfortable stage for kids who are struggling just to find their place and just to fit in. I would argue that being a member of a minority group hones a certain empathy for these challenges in particular. Being different, marginalized, sometimes even bullied, are challenges that minorities deal with on a daily basis. And so it comes to me as no surprise that minority teachers would rank highly in areas such as nurturing, empathizing, and supporting their students. Kids know when they're understood, and they can feel when they're valued. They can feel that, and it reflects in their behavior and in their academic performance. We know the value of diversity in classrooms. Now, when it comes to the actual mechanics of recruiting and retaining teachers of color, that requires intention and focus. And I can certainly understand and appreciate that the day-to-day -day priorities of administrators takes precedent over diversity initiatives that require significant investment of time, research, and planning. As a member of the village and of this community, I feel that it is our shared responsibility to make sure that we're working together to this end. In the spirit of offering up solutions, I would like to volunteer my personal expertise in the area of diversity recruitment and retention. I am an HR professional with 10 years of corporate HR experience working for companies such as Owens, Illinois, Hillshire Brands, and PepsiCo, where I headed up the regional diversity and inclusion efforts for all of South Texas. I would be happy and honored to lend my experience and expertise to work with the board to implement a strategic sourcing and recruitment program to take advantage of our local HBCUs to draw more minority candidates. You have my contact information on the yellow card, and I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Flake. Kim Hunley, please. Good evening, board, and welcome, Ms. Ownsby. How are you? Um, just, um, I was so excited my school was being featured uh, tonight, and um, you have in front of you, I gave you the story behind the starfish, and a lot of you are probably um, familiar with it. Um, it's all about making a difference, and I just wanted you to know that um, everyone in this room wants to make a difference for the children, no matter how small or grand. Um, we may not see the fruits of our labor 
next year or even in the future it may take 20 years but um, it's just a pleasure to know that we don't have to make a difference but we get to make a difference in each of these students lives and you could see from the little ones that came up today that we are making that difference so I wasn't here last month but I just wanted um, our, my members also to know and for you all to know that there will always be somebody here from the Education Association at one of the meetings whether it's Mr. Bowser or myself and if you ever have questions please you know how to reach us and I really appreciate being able to talk with Dr. Heron we meet with her monthly and we just want to keep the lines of communication open and so that we can make a difference for all our students I want you all to have a blessed Thanksgiving with family and friends get plenty of rest thank you thank you mrs. Hundley and mr. Bowser Jennifer Bickham Mendez please Good evening. Um, my name is Jennifer Bickham Mendez. Um, I'm a resident of James City County. I live on 308 Buford Road. Um, my two children um, are students at Lafayette High School. As Lisa knows, <laughs> my my son's a senior, and my daughter is a sophomore. I'm also a professor of sociology at the College of William and Mary, where I've taught and conducted my research for the last 17 years. Um, I would also like to join my friends at the village in speaking on the issue of the of teachers of color. The dearth of teachers of color in our schools. Um, the shortage of minority teachers is a national issue, but I think we would like to challenge you to intentionally address this issue at the local level here. Um, we're entering a new demographic era in our country. The United States is poised to become a majority minority country within the next 30 years. An important signal of this trend is that for the first time, the majority of public school pupils in the US are now students of color. Um, and our, as our student uh, body across the country becomes increasingly diverse, this has not been matched with increased diversity among teachers in K through 12 at the national level. Um, across the country, across the nation, our kids don't resemble our teachers. This diversity gap is evident in the WJCC school division. I sat down last night with my son and daughter, both students at Lafayette, to think about their experiences with regard to this issue. In his 13 years at WJCC schools, my son and I could identify seven teachers of color that he has had, and my daughter could identify four. When we took out instructors of band, art, and Spanish, those are the two Latinas, my son's list went from seven teachers to three, and my daughter's list went from four to one, and that one was a gym teacher. I should add, and I should add that my son pointed out to me as we had this conversation, that every day he and my daughter, as well as the other students at Lafayette High School, are served by a very dedicated and conscientious staff of cafeteria workers at Lafayette High School, all of whom are African Americans, every single one. Um, I'm concerned about the picture and the message that this sends to our young people as a parent and as a concerned citizen. There are important reasons why our school's instructional staff should resemble the school's composition. Lafayette High School right now is 35% black and brown, African American and Hispanic. Um, my colleague um, just spoke about um, the positive benefits for all students of a diverse learning environment. In my world of higher education, the value of um, um, of a learning environment that exposes college students to diverse perspectives and points of view has long been recognized. Currently at William & Mary, each unit on campus is working on diversity plans, and I'm doing this for my program that I direct, Global Studies, as well as Sociology. And these diversity plans, um, each unit will adopt in an effort to recruit and retain diverse faculty, administrators, and staff. I urge the school board to follow suit and to take up this important task. And I thank you. Thank you. Johnette Weaver, please. Evening. Good evening. I am Johnette Weaver, a resident of the city of Williamsburg. And um, my topic tonight, or what I chose to speak on, was once again the minority achievement gap. I was given great hope, and I'm not even going to really refer to my notes anymore because they kind of feel like a moot point. I was given great hope by the young people from Stonehouse who were represented here last night or tonight. Um, they gave a great example of some of the things that could be implemented, not only on an elementary school level, but also on a middle and high school level where children start taking ownership and responsibility for their own educational process. 
I have had the pleasure of meeting with the Multicultural Affairs Director for Williamsburg James City County Schools, and she shared with me some of the ideas, some of the programs that they had implemented. She's very excited about the HBCU Fair to be held this weekend, as am I, but what good is having a college fair if the children aren't prepared to go to college? The gap still exists, it's still very, very wide, and I feel as if I am one of those people who I know the dollars are very, very important. I feel as if we can build bridges and walkways to make sure that children have access to athletic centers. We can put money toward building bridges to close the gap in achievement for kids who are attempting to go to college. There are many, many ways to do that, and if we are still using some of those antiquated ideas that we've been using for the last 12 years, we need to eliminate those, eradicate them, and find new ways. If you have to start with the way things are done on an elementary level and implement them in the high schools, all of our schools district-wide can be like Jamestown High School, which is a nationally ranked school. There is no reason Lafayette and Warhill can't catch up to that. Our graduation rates could increase, and more and more children who would avail themselves of the HBCU fair actually would be getting ready to go to college. If we don't do things to change it, we're complicit in the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Jackie Williams, please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the school board. Um, thank you for having us this evening. I'm Jacqueline Williams of the Village, and I am a James City County resident. I'm here to uh, address some concerns that were brought to my attention through an email and a phone call. Um, and also some of the discussions we had last night at our meeting, I found that there was a huge concern for the children, uh, primarily the minority children are having um, concerns and anxiety and somewhat some fears right now. There are some incidents where children had, things have been said that weren't so kind to children. I won't get into the specifics this evening, but I'd be more than happy to go over them with you at another time. Um, but our concern was, is there a safe place or something that could be put in place for the children, maybe even anonymously if there's a concern about something that's being said or done to the children that is not the, being done in the kindest way. And I, I think we all kind of know what I'm talking about because we've been hearing about it on a national level, what's happening with a lot of the students right now. And just to let you guys know, we do have that concern in our community. We had a meeting last night and there was about an hour just spent on discussing concerns of some parents and some students within the community where things had been done or said that weren't um, necessarily as we would want our community to be represented, I'm sure. And uh, I appreciate your time as always, and thank you for always working with us and welcoming us, and hopefully we'll be able to further this discussion at some time. Thank, thank you, Ms. Williams. Hope Wynn, please. Last card. Good evening, Mr. Chair and others. Um, first, I'd like to congratulate Ms. Ellensby on her um, current election to the board, and thank you for your willingness to serve. Um, I'd like to preface my brief comments by saying that I know that the board is not required to address my comments at this juncture. However, I am requesting that my stated concerns be addressed at a board agenda item in the near future, if possible. Um, the WJCC School District is geographically located in the epicenter of a military industrial complex. That said, it is akin to corruption that the people of this county and the school board most specifically has yet to recognize the need in this 21st century to employ a district-sponsored ROTC program, a program which could be used as one of the tools to close this county's double-digit Jim Crow achievement gap. We have the power, influence, and affluence to make this manifest for the greater good. Um, per our conversation with the chair, several attempts have been made in the past to introduce this program, but I challenge the board, this board, and this community to commit to implementing such a program. Um, collectively, I believe it is our responsibility to prepare all of our children for the future. Which segments me, which segues me into my next and final statement, uh, which I call cause and effect. 
Some pundits assert that we elected hate a week ago today. The national news broadcast of middle schools, middle school students taunting other students. Um, the same behaviors we see on the evening news is being displayed right here in James City County. Many immigrant and minority children are faced with the uncertainty of what this election outcome means to them and their families. I have heard reports of Hispanic children being taunted and bullied by their peers with verbal suggestions that the wall is going to be built and you will have to leave the country. Hate speech and verbal assault of immigrant and migrant, chi and, and migrant children and minority children is troubling to me. What will this board do to, assert, to assess the outcome of the election regarding what systems are already in place to address immigrant targeted bullying specifically? Who is advocating to reduce student fears regarding real world issues? And what is the school board's action, if any, if this administration enacts code 287? You can Google 287G, and you can Google what 287G is. So what does this have to do with cause and effect, you might ask? Many people think that homegrown terrorism is based on hatred from one group against the other. In fact, in most instances, it can be contributed to fear. We have a lot of frightened children in our schools. We cannot be silent, and we must address these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Wynn. Those are all the speaker cards we have for this evening. Uh, that takes us to our consent agenda. I get a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. <laughs> Short way out. I move to approve the uh, consent agenda as presented. You don't want to read all those? Yeah, me neither. Is there a second? Second. So moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. Ms. Serza? Ms. Hummel? Aye. Ms. Ownby? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Thank you. Uh, it takes us to 9.01. Can I get a motion to approve revised school board standing operating procedures? Okay, sure. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I uh, make a motion that we approve the revised school board uh, standards of operating procedures as presented. Great. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Ms. Cook? On page 35, make sure. the typo, it should say CIP. Get there. Thank you. Hmm. On that one. That's right. You have the most recent copy? This is the one that we had last meeting. Then I could be wrong. Not be the first time. Sorry, my computer's a little slow here, but I made a note that. Thirty-five. You find it? Yeah. Oh, we can. We can. We can change. Yeah, it just it was a typo stuff. for C CIP. I think it was. COP instead of. Okay. Yeah. We'll look for that. Yeah. Is there any other discussion from board members? Mr. Chair. Ms. Only. I know I'm coming in late in the game. I did review these last night um, and was excited to see that I'll get a mentor. As a new board member, I think that's great um, to be in the SOP. And so the only other thought, and I know, I know this is evaluated um, each year is that if there's any way to possibly streamline it at some point. But I know I'm coming into this late in the game, so just put that out there. Maybe we'll consider that next next year. But I'm looking forward to my mentor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, right, right. Yeah, we've had that discussion about streamlining, and there's some, there's some reasons why it's not. And we, I think this is the third meeting where we've discussed those, the uh, – Standard operating procedures. We did it a couple meetings ago, and then we did it at uh, the last work session. Um, so 
but a lot of, a lot of good discussion, I think. Any other comments? It's been moved and seconded to approve the standard operating procedures as modified. Ms. Serza? Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Ms. Ownby? Aye. Mr. Kelly? Aye. Thank you. That takes us to 10.01, discussion of school board evaluation tool. Dr. Beers? Um, <clears throat> You, we, we each got um, examples of three different evaluations um, tools, uh, as well as a com as well as a comparison. One of the things that, and I looked at them really carefully as well, and um, I am coming to this a little late since uh, Mary had been um, in charge of this, and um, we, we, I spent some time here. We talked about that. Um, I. I'm not finding one myself, one instrument that is as inclusive that I, I think uh, that we ought to have. Um, I'm finding the uh, board self-evaluation questionnaire quite good. Um, however, there's virtually no discussion of the board's relationship with the public in that one. If you start to look at the other ones, um, the board eval number two, the school board self-evaluation, there's some good things there. However, it's quite general, and there's no, there are no questions um, that deal with board leadership. So my, you know, after, after looking these over, my, uh, and, and I, I understand <clears throat> we, we have somewhat of a time constraint, although um, actually, to my way of thinking, as I mentioned to our chair, uh, I've been on the board almost uh, probably 11 months now. Um, and I would like to have seen the evaluation form that was to be used by me and other members of the board at the beginning of the year so we would have those categories and have those questions in our heads as we went through the year. Um, I, I know that, uh, as, as I said, we're under a time constraint. Um, I'm, uh, I'm not overly bothered by that. Um, I do think um, that it would be helpful to um, put together an instrument that draws from um, two or three different ones. And I'm, with suggestions from other board members, I'm perfectly willing to, um, to try to do that. But I... I um, I, I think the, um, the the statements in our, our um, um, standard operating procedures um, that list those our responsibilities at the very beginning um, can be used as a basis. But as I said, um, there there's some I thought there's some really good components in, in, in these two. And I would find um, the other thing is <clears throat> some of the um, self evaluations uh, would cost money. Um, I'm contemplating coming up with an instrument that uh, doesn't cost money, and, and frankly, I don't need a norm test or evaluation form since I'm more interested in what we're, we're about and what our, uh, uh, how we evaluate ourselves. Um, so I'm not, it, it, so a national instrument um, doesn't impress me because I don't care what they're doing in California. I want to know how we're doing um, in, um, in our particular setting, given the nature of our community um, and, uh, and what our goals are. So that's, you know, kind of my, my, my thinking. So I, um, as I said, I have offered to uh, uh, kind of pull together. Um, I think um, maybe the next step would be to identify the, the major categories and uh, and go from there. I I know you know we only have a, you know barely a month left um, to do that, but I'm not that doesn't bother me. I I see no reason why we couldn't do one in January that covered the, the, the previous year. So I'm that's what I I said. I'm not as I'm not as bothered by that. I'd rather come up 
with a good instrument than try to rush through uh, just so we get it done by the end of uh, December. Any other board member comments? Zombie? If we selected one of these instruments, we wouldn't be wedded to it permanently. Like we could choose a different instrument next year. Uh, sure, sure. Um, something to consider. And then I would be all for not spending money on a self evaluation. So whatever we could do in house would be great. Me too. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm perfectly comfortable in uh, Dr. Bear's leadership on this and trust whatever you think is best. And, um, you know, these are just um, samples that uh, were acquired through a session at National School Board Association. So they're not, you know, they're, they're not. Uh, yeah, and, and, there's, uh, and I really possible. think there's some really good examples, there's some good categories. But I, you know, I wanted to point out. You know, after I looked over all of them, uh, just a couple of the key areas where this one had it, but it didn't have this other, or, you know, this one had <coughs> some really good um, um, uh, questions about leadership, but it had, there was virtually no um, uh, discussion about the interaction between the board and the public. So, um, and I think that's all, that's all, uh, that's all important. But I certainly would uh, I'd follow your, you know, your your suggestions too, if you, especially, probably more in terms of the um, those general kind of categories. And it, it's not as it's it's easier to parse out the questions once you've identified. And maybe, you know, maybe uh, we've already identified, and we just have to. Uh, they're already here. We just have to be uh, collated, and you know. Right. Any other board member comments? <clears throat> I personally like the board's self-evaluation questionnaire. I think we can definitely tailor it and personalize it to our, our needs as our but, uh, I liked what that um, instrument had um, available to us as a good foundation piece framework. No, I, I do concur with my fellow board members that I prefer that we don't spend money on this. Um, and I think that we can, in fact, I think the coalition that, that you made where you took all of them and put them together, the three different instruments, I think that was a very good starting point for for the board evaluation. So Have you done that already? I mean, I, I, I'm sorry. I did, I, well, did there's, you... there's uh, on the documents that we received. Oh, I don't think there was a... Okay. Yes. Of course, I go to completely the wrong place. There's one that's called compa Comparison of Three Evaluation Systems. Right. Yeah, there are, we did get those, yeah. 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 Gotcha. And so that could be used to, um, you know, to parse out different sections of... of, of right. Of, uh, yeah. yeah, I think Agreed. so. Right. Yeah, I mean, the timetable the time table for the self-evaluation self <laughs> is, is completely us-driven. I mean, right. it's not. So it's not yeah, like... I know that. that we that's have to. Why, I'm sorry. It's not like we have to. We're driven by any code or anything That's to do that. So it's not. It's not. Uh, so I know, just. It's the biggest deal that I'm we. I'm uh, thinking. Let's. And if, and we, if we put it off to one. put it off to the end. And, and I agree with you as far as I mean. I. I. I Holly, I agreed with uh, the board self evaluation questionnaire. I really like a lot of elements that were in that. So um, you know, use that kind of as a basis. I have no problem with uh, putting together a different instrument and sending that out, and we'll we'll go from there. So if you want to. Take a shot at that for our December meeting and pass it out, and then uh, um, we can move on from there. Unless any board members have any other issues, discussions. Good. All right, so we'll uh, go from that. You'll put, spend your turkey day uh, watching football and doing board self evaluation questionnaires. Bring it right back. This is this is one of the this is we have done um, self evaluations in the past. Um, this is will be the first shot that we've had at doing it publicly. Um, It'll be interesting to see how that works publicly, um, but uh, although it is true, I mean, I, in my research, um, it, it it also it showed, revealed that some boards do it um, uh, um, in a closed session, and others do it in in a public session. So, uh, yeah, I think I think I think the guidance we've been getting because of the sunshine sunshine laws in Virginia that it has to be done in a public right. forum unless you're. Talking about one specific well, we to, board versus the If you the want to group. go to the sunshine rules, we uh, we have even a bigger um, area that we have to deal with because other states are doing it, but I'm not going to bring that up now. 
that takes us to 10.02 fiscal year 2017 enrollment update, 10 year <coughs> enrollment estimates. Dr. Heron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Annually, the school board contracts with Future Think to provide enrollment estimates for the next 10 years. And uh, as you've already seen this evening, they provide a variety of projections, including low, most likely, and high. And generally what we do with this report is we provide it to the board and we also put it on the website for so the public can see the report as well. This year, for the first time, we'd like to present some of the highlights to you in public forum so that you're aware of some of the projections and over the next 10 years in the hope that it might um, inform our discussion of the capital improvement plan moving forward. Um, this information has just been provided to us about one week ago. Thank you, Ms. Berta is here to present it tonight. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Dr. Heron. Good evening, Ms. Berta. We're gonna jump right in. Um, the first slide shows you our, our historical enrollment. This is based on September 30th counts for the last 10 years. Over the last 10 years, Williamsburg, James City County has been fortunate to continue to grow um, and some of our surrounding districts have not had that same uh, advantage. We have grown by 1,294 students during that time period. Taking a look at September 30th of 2016 counts, in the first column, you can see the projected enrollment, which is what we based our budget off of. This is based on the Future Think report, low enrollment from last year. In the second column is the 2016-17 September 30th actual. And then the difference in the number of students and what percentage that equates to. So as you can see, uh, again, for this year, we have come very, very close to what our projected enrollment was supposed to be in our budget. And looking at the division, we estimated 11,433 students. As of September 30th, we had 11,431 students, which is two students shy of what we budgeted. We're going to have to talk about that. <laughs> Can't get much better than that. Um, so for the sixth year, sixth year, I'm happy to report that uh, FutureThink has provided us estimates that are plus or minus 1%, which is a good target when we're trying to base our budget off of numbers. We certainly don't want to over-anticipate budget because then we have to scramble to find funds to support that. So this is a, this is a good sign that FutureThink is providing us with data that is accurate when it comes to light. Sure. Um, so they're providing us accurate data on a one-year, next-year projection. Do we Can we compare that to five years ago where they thought we were going to be this year? And Sure, I can go back and do that. Just to... Yep. Because to, I'm not going to say it's easy to do it over the year, but it's easier to do it over a year versus five, 10, 15 years because there's a lot of variables that go into that equation. Absolutely. So how they develop our enrollment projections, they use a, a variety of methodologies. The first is called a cohort survival method. So they look at a student population at a certain grade level, typically your kindergartners, and they forecast based on history how long those kindergartners stay throughout their K-12 experience, and they develop a survival ratio, a percentage that applies to the budget, and that's how they develop their 10-year forecast for us. So they see how long those that group of students stays together for the 13 years of their high, or their elementary, middle, and high school experience. Then they look at housing, and they determine how many building permits are issued in any given year. They work with Williamsburg and James City County to determine that and see what those trends are and evaluate the number of potential students that are derived from a building permit. Then they look at land saturation, and they determine if there's high areas uh, in the county and city of development, and then they evaluate if they need to adjust their 10-year plan to account for those. The key to remember with enrollment projections are projections are only estimates. Uh, the further out you go, the 10 years, the less reliable they become. So we're, we're doing pretty good in the one year, and I will go back and look at the five-year trend to determine if it's as accurate as it has been in the one year. They provide us with a, a variety of models. We have traditionally in Williamsburg, James City County, used the most likely projection to do planning. So deciding where we need future buildings, future additions. We traditionally use the low enrollment for budgeting because we want to be conservative. They also provide us with a moderate and a high projection, which is in that packet of information that I left at your, at your station. 
So looking at the most likely projection and in your future think report, this, this would be detailed on pages 20 through 29. They are projecting 1,022 student growth between next year and 2027. So we are continuing to see a forecast of increased enrollment. Looking at it by grade level, the blue is your elementary. Elementary is expected to grow under the most likely projection by 282 students. Middle is detailed on the orange line in a growth of 258 students and high school green with a growth of 482 students. Taking a look at low enrollment, which is detailed on pages 31 through 35 of the Future Think report, they are projecting growth of 338 students. So a slightly lower growth with it steadying out in the out years. And again, by elementary on the blue, a growth of 82 students middle school orange with a growth of 61 students, and high school on green with a growth of 195 students. So to take that a little bit further and look at those enrollment estimates compared to capacity. So our current capacity at high school, all three high schools combined is 3,963 students. Looking at next year under the most likely projection, we would have space for 158 students before we achieved 100% capacity. Under low enrollment, we would have 206 spaces for students before we were at 100% capacity. Taking that out to 2026 and 27, on the most likely projection, we would be over capacity by 324 students. On low, we would be 11 students away from 100% capacity. Looking at middle school, current capacity, this does not include capacity for James Blair Middle School. We will add that as soon as we have foundation and actual structure. But currently we have 2,521 as our capacity. If we did not have the fourth middle school, the most likely projection would create 195 students at a, to create more than 100% capacity. Low enrollment, 180 students. Taking that out to 2026, 20, 27, most likely would cause an overage of 453 students and low enrollment of 241 students. And this is based upon 100%? Uh, based on 100%. Looking at elementary school, and the key here is this does not include our preschool capacity nor the enrollment. It is only K-5 information included on this slide. Current capacity at our nine elementary schools is 5,470. Next year's most likely projection would allow 422 spaces, low enrollment 469. Taking that out to 2026-27 would create 140 seats and in low would create 387 seats from 100% capacity. So following this evening, we will post the Future Think Enrollment Report in its entirety to the division website. This is the enrollment projection that will be used and forecast and build our 2018 operating budget. And I will certainly be glad to entertain any questions you may have. Yeah. <laughs> any board member? Seems to me like they've been spot on with numbers. Been very fortunate. Mm -hmm. Were there any surprises in this, that, you know, this most recent report that you received? No, it's still continuing to trend the same way we anticipated. Um, and I know Dr. Heron alluded a little bit to the CIP discussions. I, I do want to share with the board that when the CIP committee, development committee met, the decisions to put the high school expansion and the elementary addition where we did was based on 90% capacity. So I think we, we have to decide fundamentally as a school division what that trigger will be and what we're comfortable with that trigger being. So that can be a discussion in the CIP, but I, I wanted to share with you that the placement in the CIP was based on 90%. I just want to comment that, um, you know, one of the things that we know about our community, particularly James City County, is that it's well known for a 
as a retirement community. And so the impact when you look at building permits and so forth, um, and the impact that that may or may not have on schools. And it's true that we do have a larger percentage of the population that's over 65 in James City County. And you would think then that that would make it a smaller percentage of kids, zero to 18, but that doesn't bear out. Our averages are on par with the rest of Virginia and the country when it comes to the percentage of children in our population that are zero to 18. So where we see a deficit is 19 to 64. And so our schools, um, if you look at demographics historically and now, um, I think despite the fact that we're a retirement community, we'll continue to grow. Any other board member comments? Uh, the, the only comment I have to, to make, um, Mr. Chair, is the fact that um, you're talking about the trigger. I, the county is also, as you're aware, is very concerned about at what point uh, we trigger for a new school and uh, for for any major building um, things that we do. So I appreciate this being done because hopefully this will... Um, I, I don't think it can allay fears because you, it's, we, we don't have a crystal ball, but at least it does show that the, our, uh, so far that we're pretty much on target and hopefully we can figure out eventually how to let the county know when we're going to need a new school. Um, one of the things, when, as Mrs. Cook alluded to, about uh, transit determined number of potential students per building permit. So if those permits are um, in an age-restricted community, we would not, future think would, be, would understand that and not project those as being 25% kids going through there. Although I will say Colonial Heritage does have four or five students in Colonial Heritage. So when people say that there aren't any students in there, and when you talk about 25% growth, when you go from four to five, that is... 25% growth. <laughs> so statistics never lie. Nothing lies like statistics. Um, high school high school growth, um, I mean, we have it in the out years. Uh, I, I, having, having seen a little bit of the Pathways project and some things, I, I kind of feel like high school is going to be a little bit different than it is today than it was when I went to school. I'm not sure how much... Um, kids in seven periods of classes or four periods if they're doing block and how much, should, you know, going forward, I, th I mean, I really think high school is going to look a little bit different than it does today. And so when we start, uh, we're, we're projecting capacity, assuming that it's going to be the same as it is today. Um, but um, when you start looking at the Pathways Project, when you start looking at more career and technical ed, it, it's, it's something we have to need to keep our eye on as far as what that... Um, what that's really going to look like. Um, awful lot of data here to absorb. A um, uh, lot of lot of interesting things, uh, trends and trends and such going forward. Um, you know, when you when you we base it 100% capacity, if we if we if in any given year we choose to go to the, the schools to 100% capacity. Um, we won't get it right because kids move and things happen and then some one school will be at 105 and the other one will be at 97 and, and it's just because because kids don't come in nice neat little classroom size packages um, which is why when, when we've done redistricting in the past we've targeted 85 percent for opening a school that um, uh, so that all the schools are at, at kind of at 85 percent to to allow for some growth and allow for some for some flexibility as you as you go forward, because um, you know today we do have a lot of age restricted retirement communities. What we're gonna, what are we going to look like in five, ten years? Are we going to look more like that, or are we going to look less less like that? It, it's really kind of hard to uh, hard to predict that. So, um, but yeah, a lot of a lot of a uh, lot of uh, great information here. Um, and I appreciate uh, I appreciate you sending this to us. We might want to put this on a after we get a chance to absorb it. We might want to put it on a future agenda item just to yeah. let us have a chance to think about it and understand it before we put it put it away. So on back on the shelf, Dr. Beers. Yeah, I have a question, and you, you probably <coughs> have done this, and I haven't had a chance to look at all the tables. Sure. But, um, I, but I look at, I'm looking at the historical in the moment, and, and this sort of comes back to what I want to share. Earlier, 
is to compare the historical enrollment, say, you know, go back 10 years, and uh, see if, was it, was it closer, uh, did, it, did, did it match the low, did it match the most likely, was it high compared to the projections? Um, I'd like to see that. If, um, it, it may be in here, I just, I, you know, I haven't had a chance to talk. Sorry, but <clears throat> do you understand what I... I do. It's, yeah, because... I've, act, I've actually done that. Um, it's, well, it's right up the middle. It, it's it's falling between most likely and low most of the time. Okay, okay. But the differential is plus or minus one on either side of the equation. So it's really not drastically different if you're looking at most likely to low. Um, it's just most likely is a little bit higher, which we as finance people aren't comfortable with budgeting sure, that higher sure. number in fear of sure. you know, so conservatism. Is it uh, so? What you're saying is it's it's about the same distance yep. between the low and and the high. Mm -hmm. I what, certainly can share this with the board. I actually prepared that just for myself to have it as a talking point. Sure. Yeah. But is that in many of these charts? I like to see that. Do we have any of these charts? I can provide it to you. It's, like it's not to in their it. report. I've done yeah. the analysis. Yeah, I think you had to pull it out to, to compare it to previous reports. Yeah, yeah that would be good. It, it's, um, it is interesting. Um, we, are, we are the only school system, I believe, on the peninsula that it has continued to grow from uh, 2008 to this point. Um, so we are, we are fortunate in that, ways, in that way. Um, we have... Uh, where our growth is and how our how our growth is affecting our school system is another topic to be discussed at another day. But uh, um, we do continue to uh, be a destination school system and a destination community because of our schools. So I, uh, I uh, you know, appreciate that, and I'm sure the I'm sure the public does as well. So, any other board member comments? Um, thank you. Thank you. That takes us to 12.01, board member comments. Does it does? Oh, I already had a check mark over that. I was through with that. Sorry, Dr. Heron. Fiscal year 2018-2027 capital improvement plan discussion. Second discussion. Mr. Chair, this, Mr. Chair, this is just a, an opportunity for the school board to, again, discuss the capital improvement plan as, as presented to you and give us some insight and, and direction of any changes you might wish us to make before we bring it back for final approval in December. Thank board you. member comments? Zomi? I just wanted to first thank folks for the opportunity to serve um, Powhatan. I know I have a lot to learn. We're, we're doing the capital plan right now. We're not doing the board matters. Yet. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's, no, it's on me. It's on me. You, I, let, let me finish my sentence. Go ahead. I have a lot to learn. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm looking forward to serving the entire division. Mrs. OMB, so do I. So. <laughs> Dr. Beers? Yeah, I, I just, uh, there are a couple of um, areas that I would like a little further um, study and discussion about it at the, uh, uh, one of our upcoming um, work sessions. Um, I have, uh, I've gotten some feedback about the survey, the climate survey that we're using, and I'd like to talk some about, about that um, at our next meeting. Okay, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Are we still talking? We're trying to talk about the capital plan, but I have led everybody oh, farther no. astray from that. I thought that. we were just... No, uh, no we oh, are Okay, on. sorry. No, I, it is, <laughs> this one's on me. Well, totally. you said board comments. I did. I thought you were, we were... I said 11.01, <laughs> fiscal year 2018-2027, okay. 2027 capital sorry, improvement sorry. plan discussion. Right. We, I, we missed that. You're absolutely... No, I okay. missed that. This is on me. Okay. I, my bad. Okay. I'll rewind So, do we have any discussion on the capital improvement plan? <laughs> Mrs. Cook, can you put us on, on topic here? I would be delighted to. <laughs> so uh, regarding what I think I understood from Ms. Berta earlier today, that what is embedded in this proposed plan is uh, a 90% enrollment to trigger the uh, additions to the high school and the new elementary. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So for now, with keeping in mind uh, Chairman Kelly's uh, thoughts about what high school looks like uh, in the future and, and what kind of impact uh, new programming or adjusted programming has on space. I'm comfortable with a 90% trigger, um, and I think that gives the localities or funding partners the opportunity to, um, to plan accordingly. So um, I am 
I, I'm comfortable with the um, the CIP uh, as it's as it, it's currently presented. I appreciated the opportunity to go through the, uh, the items that are in the fiscal year 18 funding request, um, item by item, uh, with the uh, justification mm -hmm. and the cost that was um, estimated and, and where the source of that data was. So, um, you know, I think um, it is. There, there is a difference between what we know the localities have um, planned for and what we're asking for, um, and, I, and I recognize that. Um, but um, I, I think the committee, prior to going to the superintendent, and the superintendent did a good job of, of due diligence work and um, the research that went into coming to these particular recommendations, I think, is strong. And so I think that... Um, uh, that it is, you know, valid for us, and it's part of our mandate to ask for what we need. Um, if we're not um, able to get it, um, I think, um, you know, we need to understand that and work with cooperatively with our partners. But, um, but I think that this is a is a good request, and I'm prepared to support it as is. Uh, okay. The. Um if we look, if we look at the cities and the counties' budget, we're still uh, the our proposed plan is above what they have projected as our capital needs in the in the in this coming year. Correct. Right. So we still we still have a gap there that we have to we have to figure out in discussions with the uh, with the city and the county and the and our and our folks. So it's uh, you know it, it's we. We have gone through a period of uh, lack of investment, and we we have to we have to catch up somehow. And we have we have significant needs. Um, I appreciate the good work that your team has put in there, Mr. Snipes's team, in, in developing the capital plan. Um, I know it was uh, carefully considered. We had the we had the committee as well. Um, I appreciate everybody's uh, everybody's hard work and and thoughts and input to that. Um, very much appreciate. It. Thank you. Should I skip board member comments and just keep going? <laughs> uh, 12.01, board member comments. If anybody has any comments left, you're more than welcome. Mrs. Elvey. I have more. <laughs> so, and I just wanted to thank our speakers for coming tonight, and I can certainly appreciate the need for increased diversity in the field of, of education. Um, having served as a recruiter for five years at the college, um, that was my job, to increase diversity. And so I think the opportunity to work together with the community is a phenomenal idea and, and hope that um, the administration will, will reach out um, to that offer because I think um, it will take many heads working together to, to figure out how best to to meet those needs and, and certainly we want our students to to have um, their school experience to be reflective of, of who they are and their culture and where they're coming from and so we can always do better and so I certainly appreciate those those comments tonight. Hi. Ms. Taylor? I just um, also want to thank uh, all our speakers who came out tonight um, and provide that insight for us. It's so important for us to, to have. Um, and also, welcome to Miss Ownby. Ownby. No Ownby. S. I hear Ownsby. There's no Ownby. S. So There's set no the record e. straight for us here right now. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Ownby. Ownby. Okay, Ownby. Got it. Yeah, yeah. And then my kids well, are Ownby okay. Conleys. My husband Conley. I'll respond to whatever. It's <laughs> all good. Uh, Ms. Hummel? Yes, I also uh, wanted to thank the speakers that came out tonight um, uh, for Ebony. Blake and Professor Mendez. Uh, I actually do want to um, challenge the uh, school administration and uh, the HR people to take uh, these two women up on their offer. Uh, to uh, I think we have great resources at uh, in the college community and in the WJCC community. I know when I. Uh, came on the board in January and I was looking at the minority recruiting, it was a concern to me and then, um, and I was told it's a challenge. It, I've been told by the administration it's, it's a challenge to find minority teachers. And so I think whatever resources that we have 
available to us to be creative to see if there, you know see if there's something that we're not looking at or some method that we we could be exploring to be able to improve our minority recruiting it would be um, and I don't know whether that takes uh, creating a task force um, I don't know what it what it takes but it's something that I I feel really strongly about and I think we should um, make it a key kind of initiative for the school system. I know William and Mary does have diversity and inclusion as a huge part of their um, their whole initiative to uh, make it at the highest, highest level uh, of the college that, uh, that it's an important um, diversity and inclusion is, is something that is set at the highest level and then uh, to, to make it happen. So I just totally support whatever we can do to, to make this work out better for our students. So. Ms. Young. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to thank the Pathways Program uh, for the invitation to participate in uh, the um, forum that they presented. I was very impressed with the students. Uh, I, I was talking to my husband. I don't ever remember thinking that deeply in high school. I, I don't know where I was in high school, but I was impressed. And I, I, th I thought the wonderful thing about it was the fact that they already have, um, you know, for all the years we have done car career awareness and everything else, it seems like they're, they're really getting a handle on that. I was very impressed with that and very impressed with the students. I just wish I would have seen uh, a few more students that weren't headed just to college because not every student needs to go to college. Um, but I applaud that program and I'm excited to see that uh, carried further through the division to uh, Warhill and Lafayette, I mean, not, uh, to Jamestown and Lafayette. Uh, second, I, I had so much fun. I wanna thank uh, uh, Mrs. Bourgeois and Mrs. Heron and uh, uh, for the, I, the SAC meeting was amazing with the students. I was totally, uh, impressed with our high school students that are on that committee. I was happy that we made the change that that was now going to be a two-year uh, tenure on there because you could see they're, they're really starting to open it up. And it was a true discussion between students, um, administration, and the board, and they were open, which uh, that takes time to create. You, you don't do that with just one year on any, on any uh, organization. So I, I love that. I want to applaud the person who brought up JR, JROTC. That is a huge issue for me as a, a, a family of, uh, I've, I've had uh, my husband served, I've had uh, six son-in-laws and sons who have served in the military. We need to promote that. I do understand that we're, uh, I don't even know if we're on a list, but there is a high demand and the, of course the military hasn't uh, been able to provide many of those opportunities of recent times. Hopefully that will change. Um, but I would love to see JROTC in our high schools because that is a whole nother career. Uh, and also it's a program that helps students to uh, develop some goals and discipline. And uh, so I totally am with you on that. I just wanted to make a comment on bullying uh, as a parent. Um, I, I had a son who was um, left one summer. He was five foot seven. I uh, had been stuffed in a locker, um, and of course, you can imagine I uh, I knew the administration very well because I worked at the school. The next summer, when he came back, he was six four, uh, and everything changed at that point. Nobody bullied him anymore. Um, but the the process of bullying with this um, with the past election. I truly believe that we as adults and as members of this community have to set the tone. We have to set the tone of, uh, of no fear. I think, there, I'm sure that many of us have some trepidations about what's going to happen. But as a parent and as an adult, uh, when I talk to my children across, the, they're all grown, um, I, I try to keep an even keel. And if I had young children, they would not know my feelings specifically because of the fact that I want them to feel secure and safe. Um, going forward, I think we have to wait and see. And um, 
I don't want any child bullied. And I, I know that many children have been bullied of recent times. And I think that is maybe, um, I won't say it's a failure, but maybe it wasn't recognized that it was gonna be so heated even at the elementary level. I talked to a parent at Stonehouse whose uh, daughter had been bullied because of who she voted for in a mock election. And to me, that is tragic. Uh, the, the system of democracy in our republic is devised to protect people and to provide opportunities for expression, uh, freedom of expression. And if you can't even say what you truly believe anymore, we have missed the mark of what that means. I should be able to listen to you respectfully and vice versa. So that would be my only comment on that. And I do want to thank uh, all of the efforts by uh, the cabinet on our behalf and making sure that we're informed and um, and especially in the CIP process and I appreciate the enrollment update and I want to thank you and thank you Dr. Heron. Thank you Mrs. Young. Dr. Beers? Yeah, I, I'd just like to add a, a few comments about the, um, the need for uh, more diversity in, in our uh, our, our <clears throat> teaching population. I think one of the things that um, it's a it's a hard uh, it's a hard lesson. It's a hard sell. Uh, Newport News, Hampton, Norfolk, they don't have as much difficulty recruiting uh, African American, bright African American teachers. Part of it is I think um, it and it it will take a whole village, and it does take the whole community. People uh, want to feel uh, welcomed, wanted uh, when they come to the community. Um, that's one of the reasons I think we lose some of um, those really promising, um, uh, I'll call them kids because I'm old enough so I can call them kids, but um, they're more comfortable um, in neighborhoods, friends that they have down in Newport News or in Hampton. Um, I, I see no reason why we can't um, be more um, welcoming, um, but it, that's what it would, that's part of what it's going to take. It, it's, it's, it isn't just, here's a job. We want you to live here. We want you to raise your kids here. We want you to f feel like you're part of the community. And, and I, um, so I took, for me that that's part of the responsibility of the community as, as well, um, is it is hard to recruit. Um, part, one of the main reasons it's hard to recruit is there are so many opportunities for so many bright African-American kids. Um, and, um, you know, all I have to do is pick up a newspaper. Um, education it gets slammed pretty regularly. And, um, um, and so it, you, you have to be uh, fully committed um, and, um, and, and recognize that you're not going to make as much money as if you went into banking, became an engineer, that sort of thing. So it's, um, um, it is complex, but uh, they have to want to be, be here too. That's the other part. And I think that's really important um, that the community recognizes that. If we, if we um, uh, want more diversity in our student, in the, in the teaching population, um, we have to not just encourage them to apply for jobs, but uh, encourage them to live here. That means having affordable housing, all, all those kinds of things. It, it's, um, I think it's, it's really important. Um, one, let me, I just wanted to finish up a couple of things about um, our next work session. Um, I would like to have a little discussion about that climate survey. Um, I've had some feedback um, from teachers and principals, and, and I think it's, uh, it's important to talk a little bit more about that. Um, I, I've already... Um, volunteered to help with the self-evaluation, <laughs> so I will, <laughs> I will agree to do that uh, I, again. Um, um, I, I do still continue. Uh, I, I am supporting the board, but I do still have, I'm still um, uncomfortable having a totally secret um, search for our next superintendent. Um, I really think that um, they, uh, a superintendent is a public official, we do elect them. The school board votes on them. We elect them. Many states have adopted as part of their sunshine um, um, uh, rule, you know, in the rules in the state, they're requiring school boards to have um, uh, more public searches. 
So, um, and I, you know, for me, if I was a principal or a teacher, I'd like an opportunity to see who might be my next boss, ask questions, talk to them. Um, I, I don't think um, we're, it's not a corporation. We're not a nonprofit organization. Um, we're a school system. And um, um, so, you know, we may not, we may still continue on with that secret search, but, um, uh, and if the board, and if the board, we haven't actually taken a formal vote on that. We've had a straw vote on that. But um, it's just been my reading of the research, my understanding of what's happening across the country in terms of um, superintendent searches um, is, uh, uh, we are shifting. There is a shift to more public so that the public has more of an uh, impact on that. Otherwise, I'm more, uh, it's, you know, I want the public to have that, but I also want staff. I also want principals to be able to talk to a, a prospective boss. Um, just to, and, and I understand about the value of the search committee, but they have, the, you know, those are, those are individuals who have perspectives. They have their own perspectives. A principal might have a totally different one. Has totally different questions. And we're not going to be able to capture every single nuance from every single comment that is made in those um, meetings when we gather the constituents together in various groups and uh, talk to the uh, members of the uh, search firm. But that's all I'm going to say about that until... Thank you, Dr. Beers. Mrs. Cook. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Beers, for agreeing to take the lead on the board self-evaluation. Uh, very appreciative of um, uh, that work. And, you know, also following up on that, the, the SOP that we just adopted tonight, um, you know, I just want to thank everybody for their work on that. Um, everybody read that document multiple times and provided their input. So um, I just think it's... Um, um, it works best when we all uh, work together. So I appreciate that, and I think we have a good product. Welcome, Ms. Ombi. Uh, I'm really looking forward to working with you, and congratulations on your election. I would like to follow up on what Mrs. Young said about the Pathways Tour, uh, uh, or presentation. It was fabulous, um, and we were very lucky to have Congressman Whitman uh, and, uh, I guess, soon-to-be Senator Mason and um, uh, Supervisors McGlennon and Larson. I can't remember if any did. Uh, and Council Member Pons, I believe, is that? Yeah, Benny. Oh, that's right. Zhang. Sorry, Benny Zhang was there. So um, we were very um, fortunate to have um, so many of our elected leaders come to um, be thoroughly impressed by what's going on in our high schools. So that was great. Also wanted to um, say we had a great liaison committee meeting, and as soon as those minutes are ready, they'll be shared with everybody, um, but it was a productive meeting, and we're lucky to have such good partners. Um, also, thank you for the update, Dr. Heron, on the new Vision Pioneers backpack mm -hmm. thing. That's very cool that they uh, did that, um, and I really enjoyed seeing the Stonehouse presentation, particularly the focus on individualism. Uh, that's, you know, a core value here, and um, so I really appreciate that we're, that's making it all the way from, from convocation and your remarks all the way to the to the students, uh, and that's a theme throughout um, our working um, as a division. Regarding uh, the diversity in the workforce, um, I, I, recall, I recall receiving a report last year, <clears throat> at the end of last year, um, just so people are aware, that is a metric that's tracked uh, by the division. It's part of the strategic plan, and it's not just recruitment, but it's also retention. Uh, and it's also, uh, you know, making sure that we're paying attention to who's retiring and leaving and who we're recruiting. And so making sure that we're always having or trying to have a net gain. So I just want to let you know that that is something that um, this division is looking at, not saying we can't do better. We should try to do better. Um, I agree with my colleagues on that, but um, it's something that um, is tracked. I also want to remind everybody that on the home page of every, correct me if I'm wrong, please, um, but I uh, believe on the home page of every 
uh, school website, there's a, a button that you can report. Yeah, okay, I'm getting the nod. So if there's any concern about remarks or bullying or, uh, you know, something that is, is said, uh, you can, it's right there, it's one click, and there's a form very simple to fill out. So I would encourage anyone who's not feeling comfortable to, to do that, uh, to, to um, because someone will come talk to you and and you and, uh, and address what your um, your concern is uh, regarding ROTC. Mrs. Young is on it; <laughs> she is monitoring that. So it's something that. Uh, but and then um, you know regarding our straw poll uh, about the confidential search, uh, it is a dynamic situation nationwide, and I think it's right uh, a good thing to point out that indeed there are some states that require fully open searches but conversely there are states that require fully confidential searches north carolina for instance um, our neighbor to the south it's uh, illegal to reveal the names of people who apply for the superintendency so um, certainly there are rules that are on um, uh, governed by states that are on both sides of that issue so i think that's important to point out thank you Thank you. Um, I'm going to jump off where Mrs. Young and Mrs. Cook went to on the uh, on the pathways presentation at uh, War Hill. Uh, it was our it was a superintendent's business advisory committee and a, and our legislative uh, take your legislator to school day. Uh, it was very uh, refreshing to have Representative Whitman and uh, and State Senator Mason to um, to uh, come out the day before an election. I had a, a fairly long conversation with Representative Whitman. Um, and and he was really uh, really impressed with with this program and with where we were going and what the students were doing and and uh, really thought that was a great model which this is this is a we got a grant this is a model for high school innovation so um, uh, you know that's what that's what uh, the Pathways Project is I'm very grateful that uh, uh, we're going to look at continuing that at uh, Jamestown and Lafayette um, hope, hopefully on a little bit different tact. Uh, several local officials, which were men in there. Also, Jim Beers was there. God. Holly Taylor. Not, not Joe, but Jim Beers. Another one of my faux pas. Holly Taylor, um, Mrs. Young and Mrs. Cook were there, as well as um, Brian Hill from, uh, from uh, County Manager and the uh, other local officials that were there before. So the, uh, Dr. Carroll and those students, students did an exceptional job uh, talking about their projects. Um, and you could definitely see engagement and understanding, um, and it was a it was a great thing. Um, the VSBA conference is this week here in Williamsburg uh, at the uh, Williamsburg Lodge. I'm sure several of our compadres from across the state have already checked into the lodge and are looking at us on Channel 47. So uh, welcome, um, <laughs> Mrs. OMB. You do get assigned a mentor. I hope you don't mind. I would like to be your mentor if that's okay. Um, uh, looking forward to working with you over the next over the next year. Um, I think that's about it for me at this at this point. Uh, Thirteen point zero one upcoming events in addition to the VSBA conference that several of us will be attending, including including Mrs. OMB, uh, Wednesday and Thursday and Friday here in uh, Williamsburg. Uh, there's a policy committee January tenth. Gosh, we're always talking about January dates. In the, the Stryker Center uh, VSBA Capital Conference on January 23rd, and um, VSBA New Chair Board Member Orientation on January 24th. Uh, as far as upcoming meetings go, uh, December 13th in um, at the Stryker Center, we have a closed session at 6 o'clock, uh, followed by a work session at 6:30 on uh, City Council Chambers, and then on uh, January 3rd, we have a uh, closed session in the city council chambers and then our organizational meeting and work session and action items are january 3rd at 6 30 in the city council chambers at the striker center uh, with that i wish everybody a very happy uh, our faculty staff students and families a very happy and safe thanksgiving break um, uh, make sure if you travel you travel safe and uh, have a good refreshing break look forward to seeing you on the other side with that we are adjourned <laughs>